to walk with you each day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. Good to see you here. And welcome to those who are watching on our live stream as well. It is a beautiful Sabbath day. The title of my message this morning is The Truth About Calvary. You know, in the beautiful hymns that we sang, and by the way, you sounded like a real choir this morning. I was thrilled with the, with the music and your voices all in harmony. Thank you. It was very uplifting. But as I said, the, the beautiful hymns that we've been singing today and in our prayers and even in our offerings, we have spoken to our Lord and Savior. Now, through the Holy Spirit, I believe Jesus wants to speak to us. But before we begin, let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we praise you and we give you honor and glory. You alone are omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, and a ruler of all. You know the end from the beginning. You know our thoughts and you know our steps, even before we say them or take those steps. Help us today to look to you as our closest friend and our Lord. And now we call upon the Holy Spirit divine, the third person of the Godhead, from the trinity of three persons in one. Oh, Holy Spirit, come just now and fill our cup. Come, Holy Spirit, and, and shower us with wisdom and cover us with the truth that we may find the meaning of Calvary today. Teach us to love one another, dear Lord. Empower us to spread the end time message of Jesus' soon return. In doing so, may we hold fast to the great commission given by Jesus himself. You have announced our mission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And when we have fulfilled this duty, Jesus, you have said that you will return to take all your children home. Oh, may we be ready, willing, and empowered to take the gospel to all we meet. For we pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today, let's closely examine the real truth of Calvary. And I want to read 1 Corinthians, starting in chapter 1, verse 17. And this I'd like to read from the message translation this morning. It says here, this is what the Apostle Paul has written. God didn't send me out to collect a following for myself, but to preach the message of what he has done. Collecting a following for him. And he didn't send me to do it with a lot of fancy rhetoric of my own, lest the powerful action at the center, which is Christ on the cross, be trivialized into just mere words. And if we continue reading in this uh, verse, in this chapter one, in verses 18 to 25, it says this, the message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness to those hell-bent on destruction. But for those on the way of salvation, it makes perfect sense. This is the way God works, and most powerfully, as it turns out. It's written, I'll turn conventional wisdom on its head. I'll expo expose so-called experts as shams. So where can you find someone truly wise, truly educated, truly intelligent in this day and age? Hasn't God exposed it all as pretentious nonsense? Since the world in all its fancy wisdom never had a clue when it came to knowing God, God in his wisdom took delight in using 
what the world considered stupid preaching. Of this, of all things, to bring those who trust him into the way of salvation. And finally, ending up with verses 22 to 25, while Jesus clamor, well, sorry, while Jews clamor for miraculous uh, demonstrations and, and Greeks go for philosophical wisdom, we go right on proclaiming Christ, the crucified. Jews treat this like an anti-miracle, and Greeks pass it off as absurd. But to us, who are personally called by God himself, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's ultimate miracle and wisdom, all wrapped up in one. Human wisdom is so cheap, so impotent. Well, that's a lot to take in, but the truth is there for us. And I want to talk about this just a little bit. And I'm sure that we all, from time to time, have, have harbored a great longing for more wisdom and more power in our lives. But the power Paul refers to in this preaching of the cross of Jesus, there is something about Calvary. Something about Calvary. It is something that breaks the hold of sin that sin has in our life and gives us an awesome power to withstand the temptations of the devil. And I trust that all of us today have experienced this power to some extent. But dear friends, no matter how much we have received, there's still more to receive. There most certainly is. Let us see if we can discover something this morning about Calvary we may not have ever realized. That is something more of that power which is given to all at Calvary. Paul plainly states that this something is not the power of miracles that the Jews were looking for. And it's also not the power of human logic and philosophy that the Greeks delighted in. On the contrary, Paul acknowledges that the preaching of the cross is to the Jews who seek after miracles merely a stumbling block. To the philosophical mind of the Greeks, the cross was, was simply pure foolishness. More than ever, the world's take on preaching the cross has not even changed. It's still foolishness to millions upon millions, my friends, and still is maybe even more than that today. I want you to think about this. What's the real purpose of the cross? What really happened there? What happened at Calvary that will give you and me power in our daily struggles? We're all familiar more or less with the historical record in the Bible. We know that at the midnight hour, Thursday night, the mob seized Jesus and took him to the judgment hall. And after being Arraigned seven times, he was then led out to Calvary to die. As they nailed him to the cross, the rough soldiers did nothing to make his, his suffering any less. Instead, the soldiers, the mob, the spectators all joined in to make everything as cruel as possible. As Jesus hung there for those six weary hours from nine in the morning until three in the afternoon. He said very, very little, but we must know his heart was going through the, the greatest struggle of eternity. Besides the physical suffering of the crucifixion and the berating of the mob and, and the great disappointment over the fact that his very own disciples had forsaken him, 
He was at that time struggling with two great invisible battles. One struggle was over the power of Satan. Do you realize Satan was urging temptations on him, making him feel that if he gave his life as a sacrifice for sin, that he would never live again? Satan relentlessly insinuated that if Jesus took the, took the plunge to save us, it would mean eternal separation from the Father. The other awful battle that was, going, what was raging in his heart was this. There was, a, there was a mysterious darkness that had come between him and the Father. Jesus had walked in the smile of God's countenance his, all his life. Now at the hour of his, his greatest suffering, that smile was withdrawn. At Calvary, Jesus was taking the sinner's place. And the fact is, for our sakes, he had become sin, taking all our sins upon him. So the frown of God, rather than his smile, was all that Jesus could see. How this broke his tender heart. You know, in that moment, he, he called out those astonishing, anguishing words. My, my, why hast thou forsaken me? Why? Well, finally, he, he died and the disciples put him in the grave to come forth in the resurrection morning to ascend and to be our mediator. Now, I want to ask you again, what is there in what Jesus went through that gives us power to live the life of a committed follower and to do the deeds of the law? Well, let me start to answer this question by pointing out what the cross is not. The cross is not a, a sacrifice to appease an angry God. It's not a way to make God willing to accept us. Well, before Calvary, he was unwilling? No, that's not it. This is 100% paganism and is utterly false. Whether that paganism, that, that heathenism be displayed in some ancient ritual culture or in our modern times of today, whether it be in some heathen temple halfway around the world or in some supposed Christian church right here in America, any idea that some sacrifice is required in order to appease God and, and make him willing to, to love and forgive us, oh, I say, dear friends, that belief is about as far off as one can get away from an understanding of the true character of God. And you must know Satan studied the prophecies in minute details. When, after our first parents had sinned, God introduced the plan of salvation. And it was revealed that someday God's Son would come as a sacrifice for sin. And you have to know that, that Satan studied about how to pervert the thinking of men on that point so that they would not even understand the effort of God. Both before Calvary and since, the majority of humankind has never rightly understood the purpose of the sacrifice. Sacrifices are not to appease God. Jesus' sacrifice was not to reconcile God to man. On the contrary, the scripture said God was in Christ reconciling the world unto him. 2 Corinthians 5.19 And let me put this very simply. The cross happened not to change God. It happened to change you and me. Do you see that? That was its purpose. 
the reconciliation that needs to be made between God and you and God and me is not to be brought about by some change on God's part, but by a change in us. And it's through the blood of his cross that a reconciliation is to be accomplished and achieved. And if that's true, and it is, we should be able to plainly see that unless we change, unless that change is brought to fruition in us by coming to Calvary, so far as we're concerned, the cross has failed. We must acknowledge that as far as the majority of mankind is concerned, the cross has failed to reconcile them to God. And it's not because the power is not there but simply because men have been unwilling to let the power operate. We must not, then, think of the cross as some historical incident which somehow does something for us without any participation on our part. <clears throat> and then this leads us to the next point, dear friends, the cross is not an arrangement under which you and I can be saved in sin and transgression. And let me illustrate this point that I'm making here. Um, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand this morning, but did you, any of you ever get a speeding ticket? Well, okay, you can raise your hand if you want. All right, yeah, well, I see a few hands there. It's happened. Okay, relax. I, I won't ask you how fast you are going, okay? But it has happened, though, hasn't it? That's breaking the law, isn't it, Dave? <laughs> Not a felony, but nevertheless, it's breaking the law. Very well, suppose you got the ticket and you accepted it from the officer, but then you said to yourself, oh, never mind. And you think, I have, a friend who's, uh, I have a friend who's the friend of the judge, and he'll fix that ticket for me. Uh, there are multitudes of who somehow think that Calvary is something like that. Meaning that the thinking is that Jesus has died, and somehow he will fix things with the judge so that the punishment that I deserve for transgression will not come to me. And I can go right on breaking the law and there's no consequence to it. If that is what Calvary is, my friends, then where does the law of God come in? It doesn't. It is indeed as thousands of so-called Christians Christian preachers teach from their pulpits today, nailed to the cross. You see, the Ten Commandments are absolutely nailed to the cross if, I say if, Christ did anything remotely like that illustration of the ticket. But he didn't. He came to magnify the law and to make it honorable. In his Sermon on the Mount, he took pains to make it clear that he had not come to set aside one iota of the law. Not one letter would pass away, he said. The cross, then, is not to do away with the law, period. It's to do away with the transgression of the law, which is something entirely different. This is one reason why the belief of some who think that once saved, always saved, is so untrue. It's totally ridiculous to think that the law of God is of no value and no need. If the cross succeeded in doing away with the law, it only accomplished what Lucifer had set aside to do 4,000 years before that. But Jesus did not die in any way to establish the claims of Satan. 
On the contrary, Jesus died to make it possible for sin to be taken out of the hearts and lives of men, thereby reconciling them to God and, and exalting the law. So for clarity here, let's just review this a second. The cross is not a sacrifice to appease an angry God. You get that point, right? The change that needs to be made is not a change in God. It's a change in me. The cross is not the payment of a fine. It's not the, the, the meeting of a penalty. There are the meeting out of a penalty so that the law will not operate in my case. The cross is not to do away with the law. Well, what's it for then? It's to do away with sin, which is the transgression of the law. Now, do you see that? I hope you see that truth today. Then I want to ask you, friends, unless the cross has made a change in me, has it yet accomplished its purpose? Well, no, it certainly has not. And secondly, unless the cross has taken sin out of my life, has it yet accomplished its purpose? Again, I say no, not even one little bit. Oh, that the power of the cross may operate in our lives to so change us that we will know God and love him and know his law and love his law. Calvary is the way the atonement will be accomplished between us and God. There's no other way. So now let's look for just a minute at how the cross accomplishes all this. In order for you and, and I to understand that we can be reconciled to God, we must have a clear, clear understanding of God. The cross reveals God as nothing else in all the universe. Calvary shows how, just how far God will go for us. Through Calvary, he will draw us back to him. Do you know about the great controversy about God's love and power, do you know about that? It started when Lucifer falsely charged God in his law. He was, that God was demanding obedience, which God would not demonstrate in himself. Lucifer claimed that God was requiring self-denial, while God was an overbearing, selfish God. That's what he claimed. Through the cross of Calvary, in his endeavor to save us, we will understand that God will go far beyond anything that he has ever required of us. At Calvary, the love of God is revealed to the angels of heaven and all the universe. Let's also look to the cross, and when we do, we will also see it. Let's look at the, at the Calvary's cross until God's love becomes more and more real to us. And I want to bring out another important thought here this morning. You see, there's something else that is revealed at Calvary. That something is this, the character of Satan. In bringing to light the great controversy, the universe saw the devil taking Jesus and treating him so cruelly in the judgment hall and at Calvary. And as they saw how Satan inspired the cruel mob, the priests and the soldiers to heap every kind of abuse upon the Savior, heaven realized that there was nothing lovely or kind or good or uh, even desirable about Satan as they watched in almost disbelief 
to what Satan did to Jesus. They saw what he would do to them as well, were they in his power. And when you and I look at Calvary, friends, we can also see what Satan would do to us were we fully in his power. He delights in brutality. He delights in, in heartlessness and, and in abuse. When I focus on the schemes of Satan and then fall for his lies, the power of Jesus to woo and to win me is spoiled. So let's get the bigger picture of Calvary in our minds today. To help us, here is a, here's a great example. Uh, some years ago, a preacher was, was conducting a, a week of prayer in one of our academies in California. And there were two girls that came to him one day for, for counseling. And they said, Pastor, uh, we'd like to talk to you about a problem that we're having. We seem to fall over and over again when we're tempted on a certain issue. What can be done to help us? Well, they studied together, and the pastor raised this scenario to the two girls. He said, suppose the next time you girls are tempted on this issue, what if I would say to you, yes, you may go ahead and give in to that temptation. And then he continued, but before you do, first you must drive a nail into your mother's hand. He asked them, would you do that? Well, the answer obviously was no. They said, no, we wouldn't do anything like that. At that point, the pastor asked, if it meant you doing that to your mother, would it be hard to say no to the temptation or would it be easy? They said it absolutely wouldn't be hard to say no to that temptation at all if we had to drive a nail. Friends, herein lies a deeper meaning for Calvary. We must see that every sin, every sin, wounds the Savior anew. It's written in Hebrews 6.6 6, that those who continue in sin when they know better, it says there, crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. That's what it says. Crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. I really believe that this realization will come to us as we see that the thing that actually killed Jesus on that, on that dark Friday was not the wounds in his hands or his feet. Oh, no. It was the heartbreaking sorrow that sin brought on. Friends, we must know it was the sorrow for our sins that killed Jesus. And this is the picture I'd like to have us see this morning. Jesus died of a broken heart. If you, can, if you and I can see this picture, we can continue to get, or can we continue to get pleasure out of anything that brings pain to Jesus? I remember when I was a, a boy in my teens, one evening I was out a bit late and my mother was expecting me to be home. That never happened to any of you, did it? Well, in fact, the plan was for me to be in early that evening for, for some special reason. I can't remember what it was now, but something had come up, and I, and I took it upon myself to stay out kind of late. And when I got in, I could see my mother was greatly disappointed. In fact, tears were in her eyes as she talked to me. I had disappointed her. Finally, I said, Mother, if I had known how you would take it, I, I wouldn't have done it. If I had known how you would feel and feel so bad about this, I wouldn't have done it. This, my dear friends, 
is the secret of us having victory over sin. It's the secret. The reason anyone sins is because of not fully realizing how it makes God feel. Calvary is the effort on the part of God to show you and me how he feels over sin. If we hear that heartbroken cry from the cross and we realize that it, it was your sin and my sin that, that drew that cry of his broken heart, how can we repeat that tragedy? How can I go and again and again do something, anything, knowing that it will break his heart? This is the real meaning of Calvary. The power of the cross and the real meaning of Calvary, my dear friends, is to break the hold that sin has on us. You see, God tried to teach the Israelites this in the centuries before the cross. He taught it through the sanctuary service. You remember the Repentant sinner was to come to the sanctuary to bring something, what was it? An offering, a bullock or a goat or a lamb. And there by the altar, they were to place their hands on that substitute. And then what were they going to do? They were going to sacrifice it. Well, maybe they said, oh, but I can't do that. Let somebody else do it. I'll confess my sins and, and then hurry on home and the priest can slay that sacrifice. Mm, not so. The priest must sprinkle the blood, but the sinner must slay the victim. And what does it mean to us? Well, let's look at Zechariah 12, 10. And here is the power of the cross revealed through an Old Testament prophet, Zechariah 12.10 NLT, then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and on the people of Jerusalem. They will look on me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. They will grieve bitterly for him as for an infant born who has died. Notice that as we pray, we're to look where? We're to look upon him who we have pierced. Did we do that? Did we pierce anybody? Well, think about this. In conclusion, let me tell you about one of the saddest funerals that I've ever heard of. It was some years ago in Ogden, Utah, that a tragic accident happened. Uh, one morning, a father backed his car out of the garage and and his little boy happened to be in the driveway and was killed. So sad. He was just a little toddler. At the funeral, there in that casket lay that little form. And you can hear the father who was crying, the one who had killed him. Can you imagine his grief? He had killed his little boy. Oh, well, it was an accident, yes. But do you think that that took the grief out of his father's heart? You see, Zechariah 12.10 says that if you and I will look upon the one whom we have slain, whom we have pierced, we will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. Friends, did we have anything to do with Calvary? Are those nails driven by you and by me? Did you pierce Jesus? Was it our sins that broke his heart? Our pride, our folly, our worldliness? Well, friends, know this. Unless it was our sin that pierced him, our sin is still upon us. We must bear the penalty. We must bear the penalty. Unless he died for you and, and for me, we must die for that sin. 
But if he died for you, then it was your sin that killed him. And when we, when we sense that, when we feel that, we'll not want to repeat that sin. We'll understand that he died under a heartbreaking sorrow that our sin brought. And we'll not want to repeat that sorrow in the Savior's heart. The real meaning of Calvary is what this is. So may we choose to come every day and let the precious blood of Jesus fall upon us. You know, it comes down to the fact that we have a choice. If we have any heart about us at all, we can choose to either be sorry after sin or can be sorry before sin. And yes, if, if we're sorry after, we know God will forgive us. He does. But oh, how he would like it so much if we would come morning by morning and let the blood be sprinkled on our hearts before. As I'm saying, before we fall, before we sin. And then if we're sorry enough, we'll not do it again. And may heaven help us today to know the real meaning of Calvary and the price of freedom Christ paid for us. And with that said, it's the close of my message this morning, but you know, even though we're few in number here, I can't help it. I just want to make a call this morning again. If there's anyone here who wants to give their heart to Jesus, I want to ask you to come forward when we sing our closing song. If you felt the touch of the Holy Spirit and have never, never come to Jesus, and you want to do that today, please come forward. Don't wait. And I want to include another call in this. If you have felt that you've strayed away, and you want to be rebaptized, that you too would come forward if that's your if that's your heart saying that to you this morning. So our closing song, we'll go ahead and sing that now. Please send our closing song 186. I found a friend.